From NBC News Election Headquarters, this is Election Night 88, reported by Tom Brokaw, NBC News, with John Chancellor, Connie Chung, and Garrick Utley. Decision 88 election coverage is sponsored in part by All Brand, the natural high fiber cereal from Kellogg's. By GE, from satellites to medical systems, we bring good things to life. By Ford and your Ford dealer, have you driven a Ford lately? And by Merrill Lynch, an investment firm built on a tradition of trust. Now, here is Tom Brokaw. Well, we're moving into the testing time now after one of the longest and bloodiest presidential campaigns that anyone can remember during the course of this half hour. 206 electoral votes are at stake in those states where polls are closing as I speak to you right now at 8 o'clock Eastern time. So we'll know in the next hour or so the pattern of this election. And we do have some late projections for you. We're going to begin with the projections for Vice President George Bush. First of all, the important Middle South state of Tennessee, NBC News now projecting George Bush, the winner in Tennessee, with the 11 electoral votes in Tennessee tonight. Also in Alabama, nine electoral votes. In Mississippi, seven electoral votes. Up in the Great Plains, Kansas, seven electoral votes for Vice President George Bush. Those are all solid Republican states, and those are expected to go into the Vice President's column tonight, and they are as scheduled. Oklahoma, a total of eight electoral votes. Count them for Vice President George Bush. That means that he's picked up 42 as the polls close at eight. And for Michael Dukakis, his first electoral votes of the evening, the old standby for the Democratic Party, the District of Columbia, once again, that goes into the Democratic column, three electoral votes there. So this is how it stands now, 270 needed to win. The vice president has 120. Michael Dukakis, the governor of Massachusetts, just three. And the popular vote is now up to 3%, still an eight, or rather a 16-point spread between Bush and Dukakis on that count. And NBC's Garrick Utley, who's keeping track of the Senate and congressional races, tells me now that one of the most hotly contested of these Senate races has been settled according to our projections, Gary. And perhaps a very significant one too, Tom. It's in the state of New Jersey, and we can now project a winner there. It is the Democratic incumbent Frank Lautenberg in New Jersey. We project that he has defeated Pete Dawkins, the Republican candidate. Lautenberg going back to a second term in the Senate. What is important in New Jersey was that the Republicans thought they had a real shot at taking away a Democratic seat. Pete Dawkins, former Heisman Trophy winner, youngest general in the U.S. Army, Vietnam veteran, a golden boy if there ever was one, but he failed. He did not beat Frank Lautenberg, although Bush and Reagan campaigned for Pete Dawkins in New Jersey. That may be significant, Tom, or it may also be because of the fact that the voters of New Jersey have not defeated an incumbent senator in 46 years. Well, uh, after all, uh, Pete Dawkins is a young man. He's only 50 years of age. He still has those impressive credentials. He still has a lot of time ahead of him, and he's very interested in public service. So I suspect that we'll be hearing from him in one capacity or another. When he'll, whether he'll run for elective office is quite another question. John Chancellor, what about the economy in the course of this campaign? I think it's very important, Tom. If you take a state, we, you've just projected Mississippi in the Bush column. Uh, when we asked the voters, uh, have you benefited from Reagan economic policies in Mississippi, 50% said yes, they had benefited. Only 39% said no. But think of a state like Pennsylvania, which is we, a state we have not been able to project. 47% of the people we polled in Pennsylvania said they hadn't benefited. The same thing it comes out about optimism and pessimism on the economy. When we asked voters in Mississippi, do you think the economy will get better next year? 44% said yes. Bush took that state. Pennsylvania, the toss-up state, when we put that question on the future of the economy to them, only 26% said they thought the economy would get better and that state could, we don't know and we're not hinting, could go to Dukakis. So so these pocketbook issues, Tom, as you say, are very important, and they're what's partially driving this election tonight. John Chancellor, someone who's watching all of this with extra care tonight, is former President Gerald Ford. He's at his home in Rancho Mirage, California. He'll be out with us throughout the evening. We say Palm Springs above you there, Mr. Ford, but I know that you're <laughs> probably in Rancho Mirage. That's where your home is located. Listen, the polls are still open out in California, but when all the polls are closed, however this one turns out, do you think that it's time for both parties to get together and try to get some reformation into the presidential election process? Tom, there's no question about it. Uh, I think uh, the nomination and election process takes too long and it costs far, far too much money. And I think it's uh, an obligation of the newly elected president, members of Congress, and 
leaders throughout the country to get together to find a way to condense the campaign and at the same time to reduce the cost. Uh, my, my own feeling is that with a long, long campaign, and we've had one now for two years, there is a tendency on the part of the voting public to get bored and not participate. And that's very unfortunate. Uh, how much do you blame the press for the kind of campaigning that we've had this time? I ask that question not because I'm, I'm looking to inflict a wound on myself, but because I know a lot of people are out there wondering about the role of the press, and a lot of people have been very critical of how we conducted ourselves. You no longer have to deal with this, Mr. President. You can be as free as you want to be. Well, it's a combination, Tom, of um, some of these professional campaign managers, both Democrat and Republican, who sort of... Uh, do well if they have a big media campaign. So they generate these uh, very negative ads, which are very saleable, particularly on television. But then the press sort of feeds on uh, that kind of sensationalism. And the combination, in my judgment, has uh, made this campaign, unfortunately, uh, much too much uh, a personal attack. Uh, I do believe, however, that the public is going to insist that next time, four years from now, there be some corrective action if that's possible with, within our constitutional rights. All right, Mr. Mr. President, thank you very much for being with us, and you're going to be with us throughout the evening, so we'll be checking back with you. We may even ask you today's golf score before we're all through this <laughs> evening. And Thanks very time, much. time, Tom. All right. Gerald Ford in Rancho Mirage, California, NBC's Connie Chung. Tom, we make such a big deal about Reagan Democrats. The media seems to be obsessed with Reagan Democrats. Who are they? They are people who identify with the Democratic Party but voted for Ronald Reagan in 1984. Now, Bush campaign strategists have consistently said that Bush only needs one-third of Reagan Democrats to win. So let's take a look at our sampling as it continues across the country. So far, here are the numbers. Bush is winning 41% of Reagan Democrats. Dukakis is winning 59% of Reagan Democrats. He's bringing them back home to the Democratic Party. Superficially, you might say that's good for Dukakis, but bear in mind, once again, Bush strategists had said that all he needed was one-third, and if you want to believe these figures for now, so far, he's getting that. Now, who are Reagan Democrats? We have this impression that they are Joe Sixpack, the, uh, the lunch pail factory worker, but indeed they are not. They are white collar, they can be blue collar, they can be professional, managerial. And more importantly, Reagan Democrats is probably a, a new phrase for an, for an old a person who has been around for a long time. If you go back and look in history, you'll see that a lot of Southern conservative Democrats have been voting. They've been straying away from the Democratic Party for quite some time. They can also be Catholics, Catholics in the Northeast. Now, Ken Bode talked with a lot of voters in Akron, Ohio, about this specific subject, and here's his Precinct Express report. Connie, I'm in Akron, Ohio, outside the King Elementary School. I'm with Mike Petrus, who tells me that you voted for Reagan last time. Yes. And who did you vote for today? The caucus. I didn't care for the Republicans' uh, ticket of Bush and Quayle. The idea scares the hell out of me one heartbeat away, and that, that possibility is always there. Seven precincts vote at this school. It's a white-collar crowd, lots of professionals, a mix of Republicans and Democrats, and they tended to split their votes. They also voted on issues. Mary Ann Walter is a Democrat who voted for Bush. And Democratic was pro-choice. Right. Right, and I'm not pro-choice, I'm against abortion. My uh, inspiration for voting for Michael Dukakis has to do with uh, the Supreme Court, um, and it's a vote against Bush. I voted him because I believe in what he stands for and also because I don't believe in the polls that tell the people that the race is already over before the vote has been taken place. Francis Gardner, age 81, is a registered Democrat who voted twice for Reagan and today for Bush. Why? Democrats to me are too liberal, in my estimation. Too liberal. From Akron, Ohio County, back to you. All right, thank you, Ken. We'll be talking about liberal conservative later on. Tonight. Even though you'll be talking, as we all have been, about polls, a lot of people were very unhappy with polls during the course of this year, of course. In fact, it started a joke around here. How many pollsters does it take to screw in a light bulb? Two, plus or minus four. We'll be back after this.
All politicians like to talk about their ability to count. Well, the important number to count tonight is the electoral vote. 270 are required. So far, most of the states that have checked in are in the Bush column. That means that he's got almost all the electoral votes. None of them a surprise, however. 270 needed to win. And as you can see, George Bush has 120. Mike Dukakis has three from the District of Columbia. The popular vote is less important, but still fascinating. 4% of it has been counted. It's been staying at about that spread now at uh, eight points altogether. Uh, how's the vote going in some individual states? Well, let us show you what's going on, first of all, in the state of Kentucky. You see, by the way, those states up there that are colored blue, they belong to the vice president. Red will be for Dukakis tonight. In Kentucky, most of the vote has been counted at this hour. A sizable lead for George Bush. Democrats had hoped that they might even be able to win that race or at least keep it close. But at this hour, at least, it's a, as you can see, a 14-point spread. And in Indiana, uh, that's solid gold for the Republicans out there. It's been going... Uh, Republican ever since uh, Lyndon Johnson won it in 64, 20 point spread in Indiana, the home of Dan Quayle, among others. In Virginia, which borders on the nation's capital, almost 40% of the vote has been counted. Chuck Robb, the Democratic senator, uh, we, is our projected winner, but Bush with a commanding lead as well in Virginia. South Carolina, same story, one fifth of the vote has been counted there. A big Bush lead in South Carolina. And in Alabama, remember when they used to call this the solid South for the Democrats? Well, guess what? It's now the solid South, but for the GOP. 13% of the vote has been counted. And as you can see, what we have there is a very commanding George Bush lead. Standing by in Washington is a man who wanted to be here this evening in a different capacity as one of the presidential candidates. He's the Republican leader of the United States Senate, Bob Dole. And Senator Dole, let me say to you, first of all, thanks very much for being with us tonight. And let me ask you about priorities on the legislative agenda come January 20th, whoever is president of the United States. You gonna, go ahead. They're going to have to deal with a deficit uh, right up front, uh, long-term health care. Uh, those issues are going to be here waiting for the next president. Looks like it's going to be George Bush. And we'd like to have a majority of Republicans in the Senate to help him. Uh, Senator Dole, uh, all of our polling today indicates that people do identify the deficit by a factor of two to one as their number one concern. But the vice president has said, watch my lips, no new taxes. And just last week, you were saying on the Sunday talk shows that he cannot keep his promise not to raise taxes if elected. My view is we don't have to touch tax rates on, on individuals or corporations. But when you rule out everything, user fees, excise taxes, any kind of a tax that might even support a program, that's going to be difficult to do. But George Bush has said no new taxes. I'll be willing to help him in that effort. Uh, and we'll see what the Democrats have to say. What happens when that National Economic Commission checks in with your friend uh, Bob Strauss and Drew <laughs> Lewis from the Republican side and says, listen, you're going to have to do something about those user fees. Bush has already said those guys don't count. Well, I know. He took, uh, uh, that was brought up in the New Hampshire race. I supported the Economic Commission. Bush did not. Now, he'll have a right if he's elected to add two new members. It'll sort of be his commission then. And I would hope he would use that to make some uh, good suggestions to Congress and the president for deficit reduction. All right, Senator Dole, one last quick pick from you. What's right. the big surprise for the night, in your judgment, that we should look for? I look for a big surprise out in Montana. I look for Conrad Burns to meet John, meet incumbent Senator John Melcher. That'll be a big surprise. We've only had one senator in Montana in 100 years, one Republican senator. All right, thank you very much, Senator Bob Dole. Let us remind you once again, polls still are open in many of those western states including montana and you do have an opportunity to vote we will not be projecting any of those races until the polls have closed in those states here's gary Cotley. gary a lot of results are coming in now in senate races across the country with polls closing in those respective states let's just get at them first of all in texas no surprise here for Lloyd Benson. We don't know how he's going to fare this evening in the presidential race with Michael Dukakis, but it's good news for Benson. He has been re-elected to his fourth term as Democratic senator from Texas. It's possible in that state to run both as a vice presidential candidate and as a Senate candidate. Lyndon Johnson did it back in 1960. Of course, Johnson won the vice presidency, but Benson is secure in the knowledge he has a Senate seat and he will continue in the powerful position of chairman of the Finance Committee. In Pennsylvania, we can now make a projection. John Heinz, the Republican incumbent, will re be returning to the United States Senate. Moving on to Maryland, a Democratic victory there. It's a grand night for the incumbents. Paul Sarbanes, the Democratic senator from Maryland, defeated uh, Alan Keyes, a conservative Republican, a black intellectual, very articulate candidate. 
uh, Ronald Reagan campaign forum, but Sarbanes won and is being returned to the U.S. Senate. In Tennessee, another incumbent uh, enjoys victory tonight. He is Jim Sasser, going back to the Senate for his third term, no real problem there. Going on to Missouri, same story for John Danforth, the Republican, the heir to the Ralston Perina fortune, a very active member of the Senate in trade questions. He ran an, advertising, uh, an advertisement in his campaign in Missouri saying that he was the most feared American in Japan. That may have helped him in Missouri. In Massachusetts, no surprise at all, Edward, Edward Kennedy, Edward Kennedy re-elected, I'm sorry, uh, William Roth of Delaware is now up there as a projected winner in the Senate in Delaware, defeating, defeating S.B. Wu, the lieutenant governor of that state. One election that we're watching very closely tonight is in Minnesota, where the incumbent Dave Dernberger is facing a very severe challenge from a famous name in American politics, Hubert Humphrey III, and Ann Rubenstein is standing by there. Ann? Good evening, Garrick, from Minnesota. As you said, this race is between two well-known people in Minnesota, Republican incumbent Dave Durenberger, a 10-year veteran of the United States Senate, and a name that carries tremendous historical significance here. Hubert Humphrey III, the son of the late senator from Minnesota and vice president, of course, known around here as Skip Humphrey, who serves as the state's attorney general. Throughout this campaign, Durenberger has enjoyed a lead in the polls, sometimes ranging from 10 points to 20 points. Voter turnout today in this Minnesota chill to Day, a beautiful day across the state weather-wise. Voter turnout was heavy. That should favor Humphrey. Voter turnout may be up to 70 percent, which would be above what it was in 1984. So that will have a factor in this race as well. We don't have any numbers to report to you yet. We'll be watching this throughout the evening in Minnesota. Back to you, Garrick. Thank you very much, Ann. And going on with some of the projections we're able to make this evening at this hour from Senate races, uh, most of them in the eastern part of the country. We mentioned a moment ago that Edward Kennedy has been projected the winner in the state of Massachusetts. That's Kennedy there, of course. Uh, there's no question of his victory. Moving on to Maine, George Mitchell, the Democratic incumbent, is projected as the uh, re-elected uh, senator. He is in line for the majority uh, leadership position in the Democratic senator. He wants to have that position in Delaware. William Roth, we already mentioned. And finally, in Michigan, Don Regal, the Democratic incumbent, going back to the United States Senate. Uh, no trouble with uh, Regal's victory there. I would only note, Tom, that in that race, his opponent, Jim Dunn, actually sued his own party. He said the party had promised him $400,000 in campaign funds. They didn't come through. He went to court. The judge threw it out. He didn't give him the four hundred thousand nope, dollars. They get, get a lot more people back in politics if they think they can win those kind of suits. In New Jersey tonight is uh, Senator Bill Bradley, who is uh, probably very happy because NBC News has projected that his Democratic colleague Frank Lautenberg is the winner in New Jersey. Senator Bradley, you were just listening to Senator Bob Dole talk about the priorities for whoever is elected come January twentieth when Congress comes back into session. Do you agree with him that we're going to have to do something immediately about the deficit, and it probably will include a raise in taxes? Well, I think the deficit's uh, on the top of the agenda, but I also think third world debt, exchange rates, a new strategy for multilateral trade talks, and some strategy for dealing with Mikhail Gorbachev uh, are all on the agenda of the next president. All right, thank you very much, Bill Bradley. We've got some late developments here. We'll try to come back to you, so if you could just stand by, we'll get back to you uh, in just a few moments, or at least later in the evening. Never promise an anchor, never trust an anchorman on an election night. We'll be back after this. Yeah. I take it back. You can trust an anchorman. We are back. And we'll tell you now what the electoral vote is. 270 required to win tonight. All of those states that you see in our map are in blue. For George Bush, he has 120 electoral votes. Mike Dukakis gets three from the District of Columbia. And that means in the popular vote now that we've got 5% uh, of it counted. As you can see, the spread now is about 14 points altogether. We'll be back after this. This is the NBC Television Network. This is Decision 88, Channel 4 News coverage of the 1988 general election. Brought to you in part by Sprint's Furniture and by Cumberland Hall. NBC News election coverage continues. 
Here is Tom Brokaw, NBC News. Good evening once again. You may remember that four years ago and then eight years ago at this hour, Jimmy Carter and Walter Mondale were well on their way to retirement and Ronald Reagan had been our projected winner. That's not the case tonight. We still have some key states to check in and one now we are now able to project for Vice President George Bush. He is our projected winner in the important state of New Jersey. That's a northeastern industrial state with 16 electoral votes. So on the map, New Jersey goes blue for George Bush. As the Dukakis states come in, they'll be colored red. Also, down south, not a surprise here, the projected winner in North Carolina is George Bush with 13 electoral votes. What does that mean in terms of the total at this hour after we see North Carolina fill in with the rest of the south in blue the color of Dan Quayle's eyes? Uh, and now we have a late projection that was not, uh, uh, not surprising at all. This was fully expected. Texas, George Bush, the winner in Texas, 29 big electoral votes. Earlier tonight, Lloyd Benson said, we've got a shot. Well, they didn't have at all. Uh, that is one of the home states, of course, of Vice President George Bush. And that means that the electoral vote total for him now is getting to be an impressive number, 178. He's less than 100 away from the magic number. 7% of the popular vote has been counted, 57 to 43. A reminder, polls still are open in much of the country. We will not be projecting any of these states, any of these states, until the polls have been closed. But it is conceivable that one of these two men can win enough electoral votes in the South, the East, and the Midwest before all of the polls have been closed in the West. And therefore, no matter what happens out West, if that scenario proves to be the case, that person will be the 41st president-elect of the United States. Someone who's standing by watching, no doubt, with a good deal of happiness, that last projection, is John Tower, the former senator from the state of Texas, who helped build the modern Republican Party down there. And if his friend George Bush is elected president of the United States tonight, there's a fair amount of speculation that Senator Tower will be the new secretary of defense. In any event, I know that it's a subject of great interest to you, Senator Tower. Let me read you some poll numbers from our Election Day poll of voters. Almost all of them said that they think that defense spending in this country should be decreased or stay the same. Only 14% want it to go up. Will it have to go up in your judgment in the next four years? I think we ought to look at it this way, that a majority of the American people feel that we should spend as much as is necessary to at least stay abreast of, if not be superior, to Soviet military power. However, due to all of the procurement problems that we've had lately, and all the charges and, uh, and uh, incidences of so-called waste, fraud, and abuse, the national consensus for high defense spending has gone down. I think that that consensus can be restored once we get a handle on some of the problems with our procurement policies and our procurement procedures. I presume, by the way, that if your friend Vice President Bush wins tonight and he comes to you and says he'd like you to be Defense Secretary, that you'd be inclined to accept. Well, uh, the Vice President hasn't gotten into the business of cabinet selection yet. It's really premature to talk about cabinet selection before the votes are all in. And uh, I've not discussed it with him. I don't think he's discussed it with his closest intimates. And it remains to be seen. Uh, what the cabinet would shape up like, but I'm sure it's going to be a strong cabinet. By and large, would you expect it to be a continuation of the general Ronald Reagan defense and national security policies? Well, I think, uh, I think in its fundamentals that there will be the continuity because Bush, as Reagan, believes in, in a strong uh, military to preserve the peace, to serve as a deterrent, to give us the negotiating leverage with the Soviets that's needed to achieve uh, significant arms reduction. So I think you, you basically see a continuation of, of the Reagan policy of a strong national defense. Thank you very much. Uh, former Texas Senator John Tower talking to us tonight from uh, Texas. By the way, one of the key states that we just projected was the state of New Jersey for Vice President Bush. He campaigned in that state eight times. And since World War II, New Jersey has gone Democratic in a presidential race only once. That was back in 1960. So all of those visits did pay off. George Bush did everything but build another Bush home in New Jersey. Connie Chung, what have you been learning from our Election Day poll of those 60,000 voters before we're all through tonight? Tom, we want to look at how men and women are voting. Now, early on in the campaign, George Bush was suffering what from what they called the gender gap. And it was around the time when people were saying George Bush reminds every woman of her first husband. Well, we want to find out how did women vote and how did men vote. Women tend to vote differently from men these days. Long time ago, they used to vote the way their husbands did, the way their fathers did, the way the men their age did. But now women are voting for change. For the most part, generally, women tend to vote for change. Why? Because they can't seem to 
to spit out the word prosperity. They don't see current economic conditions as being favorable for them because they don't feel it. They are making less than maybe $20,000 a year. They are last hired, first fired. They don't have benefits. And so do they want change this year? That's the question. Did they vote for Dukakis? Let's look at the numbers. Among women, Bush is getting 48% of the vote. Dukakis is getting 52% of the vote. Among men, Bush is getting 55% of the vote, and Dukakis is getting 45% of the vote. Let's keep this graphic up for a minute. What we're looking at is the difference between the way men and women have voted. And in our early returns thus far, what we see in our exit polling is that Dukakis is winning the women's vote a little more strongly, and Bush is winning the men's vote. Now, Tom Pettit was in Albuquerque, New Mexico. He was talking to some women there, and here's what he found. Albuquerque, New Mexico, 1,600 miles from New York. This city of 350,000 people is a mix of ethnic groups. And we asked women how gender affected their vote today. Patty Howley, 38, mother of two and expecting her third, voted at the Montezuma Elementary School. I believe, and this is a heartfelt thing, that um, Michael Dukakis is, is, believes that women are equal and can do um, equal work and... I've never had that feeling from George Bush, and part of his abortion stand is um, I disagree with that, and, and I do agree with Michael Dukakis. Sarah Lucero is a teacher and a mother. I felt his stand on abortion also. I feel as that that's a, very much a woman's right to choose, and I think that also uh, determined my vote, too. Not everyone agreed. If female, I think, issues. If you're really strictly into that, you would be going more toward the caucus. Mm -hmm. But uh, there are other issues and there are other things to consider also. Yeah. At least here in Albuquerque, women seem to be voting their convictions more than their candidates. Now back to you, Connie. Thank you, Tom. Early on, Dukakis had a lead among women. His own pollsters saw it vanish, Tom, in a matter of uh, weeks and, and short months. Now, they're back. It seems to be coming back his way. You know, the numbers uh, are very telling for the Democrats in national campaigns, quite obviously. Uh, since 19, well, since the war, actually, Democrats have won a majority of the popular vote only twice. Harry Truman did not. He was below 50 percent. Lyndon Johnson won 61 percent of the vote. Jimmy Carter won 50 percent of the vote. That's only twice that the Democrats have been able to get a majority of the popular vote in this country, which gives you some idea of how much of a struggle Democrats have had in national elections since World War II. And I say all that because we want to tell you that Lyndon Johnson also won New Jersey in 1964 when I said a few moments ago that John Kennedy was the last Democrat to win New Jersey. 178 electoral votes for George Bush at this hour. 270 are required to win, three for Dukakis. The popular vote now up to 8%. The spread at this hour is 14%. A couple of uh, key states have gone to the vice president, but this is by no means over because some big and powerful states have now closed their polls, but we cannot yet project who will be the winner in places like Pennsylvania and Illinois and Ohio. We'll be standing by to get those to you as soon as that we are able to. We've got a couple of wizards in the other room who are looking at the results even as we talk. John Chancellor, a lot of talk in Washington about higher taxes. Watch my lips. Are we going to have higher taxes next time around if the people have their say? Read my poll. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> they, we are finding that, you know, the dreaded T word, taxes, well, a lot of people are telling us that they would be willing to pay more taxes if certain things were done with that money. And I think that's very important. Even if taxes go up, they say the next president should do more on health care for everybody in the country, more on protecting the environment. And in smaller numbers, they're telling us we'd pay more taxes if you could do something about AIDS, if you could do something about daycare. Now, the environment worries most voters and prompts them to say, yes, we'll pay more taxes if you can really do something to clean up the environment. And the breakdown is fascinating. As you might expect, liberals, which includes that uh, demographic subgroup called tree huggers, say that 84% of the liberals say, yes, we'll spend, we'll pay more taxes if you'll do something about the environment. But look at this, 66% of the conservatives say yes taxes. We'll pay them if you'll do something about the environment. I don't know if anybody has a mandate in this election or these figures as we've seen them so far, but clearly, Tom, the voters are saying they want some things done and they're willing to pay for it. And as we talk here tonight in Washington, a National Economic Commission 
uh, headed by Bob Strauss for the Democrats and Drew Lewis for the Republicans at work, and no doubt they have a number of taxes in mind for the recommendations between now and January 20th, when the next president take, and they'll provide a kind of air cover for all the politicians. But Bush is, has been saying, and his camp, as you well know, Tom, yeah. Bush is no friend of this commission. Uh, and partially, we are told, because Bob Dole helped set it up and has said he doesn't like the idea of a commission telling a new president what to do. But I think there's a lot of popular support for the commission saying, let's do something about bringing in some money. Senator Dole and Vice President Bush, who had such a head-banging contest in the primaries, now refer to each other as only Dole and Bush. We'll be back after this. In politics, as at parties, you can stay too long. One of the most familiar faces in the national political scene is gone tonight, Gary Cutley. His name is Lowell Weicker in the state of Connecticut, a major upset. We are projecting now that Lowell Weicker has lost, and that means that the winner is Joseph Lieberman, a Democrat, the Attorney General in Connecticut. This is quite a story, because Lowell Weicker is one of the most liberal Republicans in the Senate. He squeaked through before, but tonight, well, there's the story. With more than a third of the vote in, Lieberman is the projected winner. It was a strange, curious race that Weicker was endorsed by the AFL-CIO, the unions there. Lieberman was running to his right. What more can we say but Lowell Weicker, one of the more interesting personalities in the United States Senate, is not going back to Washington. Joseph Lieberman is. In other news tonight, we're also covering the House races. No real individual results to report yet, but we want to take a quick look at what's happening in the news of the House itself to bring you up to date. This is the old House, the 100 uh, Congress, 178 Republicans, 257 Democrats. No chance the Democrats are going to lose control. But big questions as to how the Democratic-controlled House would be functioning if, I repeat, if George Bush is elected tonight. And in Chicago is Dan Rostenkowski, who is a congressman, a very influential member of the House, chairman of the Ways and Means Committee in the House of Representatives. Good evening, Congressman. Hi, Garrett. Tell me, you're seeing the results coming in. If it is a Bush victory tonight, and we have not made that projection yet, you have read his lips. You have heard him say, <laughs> no new taxes. You served with Bush in Congress. You are a personal friend of George Bush. Does he really mean it? Well, Garrick, I don't read lips, and if, uh, if George Bush wants to do something about the deficit, I just don't see how he can do it without putting into the equation revenues. And you can cut defense spending, and you can cut uh, social programs, but if you're going to get Democrats to support your program, you've got to talk about revenues. Now, uh, what worries me a little bit is how long is it going to take any president to do the 180 degree turn that's necessary to recognize that he has to work with Congress. I think that's the most important ingredient uh, that, will, uh, that will surface after this election. Well, if Bush is elected, what are you telling them? What's the signal you're sending him tonight? How much time will he have to make that 180 degree turn? Well, that's a determination that Bush will have to make if he's elected. It's also the determination that the caucus would have to make. I think that the commission that will make a recommendation is cover for both the executive and the, and the congression. Now, I don't, uh, I don't know that uh, with Bush feeling it, uh, the commission as an adversarial relationship is going to help us solve the problem. Congress no Congressman, Bush has also proposed a reduction in capital gains to 15 percent. Briefly, your response. Is this possible? Well, if he's going to lower capital gains, he's going to have to uh, raise marginal rates. And that's something that both Reagan and Rostenkowski have been trying to protect for the people. I just don't know that we can do that if Bush wants to lower capital gains. Congressman, thank you very much for being okay, with us this Garrett, evening. Nice to talk to you. In the governor's races, we now have some projections to make in races in Delaware. First of all, we can now project that Michael Castle, the incumbent Democrat, uh, sorry, first Ashcroft in Missouri, the Republican incumbent, re-elected for another term there. Moving on in the governor's races. We also project Michael Castle in Delaware going back uh, to the governor's office and in North Carolina, James Martin, Republican re-elected in North Carolina and in Vermont, Madeline Coonan, the woman, Madeline Coonan, re-elected in Vermont. We're catching up there. That's Martin in North Carolina and Madeline Coonan in Vermont. It is when you add it all up with a, one exception in Virginia, Tom, 
a good night for the incumbents. The incumbents are winning these races by and large. But a surprise in Connecticut, ultimately, even though we knew that the Lieberman-Weicker race was going to be very close, and Lieberman was well financed, he dipped down to New York, got some money from uh, liberals here who felt strongly that maybe he could be helpful to them, but they felt bad about giving money against Lowell Weicker, for example. And he's just killing Weicker, as I read the mm -hmm. computer, in Hartford and New Haven and other parts of the state. I mean, it's a wipeout in Hartford and New Haven for Weicker. Very much a, a referendum on Weicker himself and his personality. The people of Connecticut have had sort of a very uneasy relationship with him over the years. Gentlemen, gentlemen, we've got a call. Michael Dukakis will be relieved to know that he's won his home state tonight. Massachusetts, NBC News now projecting that Massachusetts Governor Michael Dukakis is the winner in the Bay State of the 13 electoral votes there, and he begins to get some numbers on the board as a result of that. 270 electoral votes are required to win. And in Massachusetts, we're going to color that blue, uh, color that red, pardon me. Red is the color for Mike Dukakis here tonight. And uh, that's an important cornerstone for him uh, as part of his strategy as he tries to build in New York and Pennsylvania and Ohio and Illinois across the Northeast and then go out West. That's the strategy at this hour. 178 electoral votes for George Bush. Michael Dukakis gets the three that he got in the District of Columbia. And then we add the 13 that he gets in Massachusetts. We'll get around to that. Trust us, our computers will begin to work again. 10% of the vote has been counted so far. As you can see, George Bush has a lead now of 14 uh, points. And in Texas tonight, Lloyd Benson. Well, you lost your home state, uh, Senator Benson, but Mike Dukakis has won Massachusetts. Is your strategy still alive at this hour? Oh, of course it's still alive. Tom, uh, I'm not sure we've lost our home state. The one thing that the pollsters never are able to predict is when you get an extraordinarily large turnout. And in some 2,000 precincts where we have our get out the vote going, we have it up by some 6%. And uh, that's a Democratic vote that the pollsters would not have anticipated. So this state is still hanging in the balance. I think it's going to be a long night because uh, we're leading in Pennsylvania with a little edge and got a good edge in Illinois. Uh, so, and on the West Coast, it looks like uh, we're ahead in California and Washington and Oregon. Senator Benson? But I think we'll be around for a while tonight. Well, uh, we want to remind everybody that the polls are still open in those uh, Rocky Mountain states and out west. I want to ask you, however, whether you have any regrets tonight about what has happened in the course of this campaign. Oh, you always have some, you know, if, if you want a Monday morning quarterbacking it, uh, quarterback it, but I'm not doing that. I'm looking to the future. Do you think that the head of the ticket, Mike Dukakis, should have taken that more energetic kind of populist approach earlier? Well, that's Monday morning quarterbacking. I think the last uh, three or four weeks, he's very much been able to get his message through, and I think that's one of the reasons that that we're going to be taking a number of states before this evening is over. Senator Benson, uh, you'll, if you do win tonight, it will be a struggle. I think everyone would agree with that. And there is a strategy that makes it possible. Why are the Democrats struggling every presidential election? I mean, you really have to cobble it together to win. Well, the Republicans have done an extraordinary job in the way of negative advertising. And they were able to bring up the negatives on Mike Dukakis and bring down his positives. It was a premeditated thing. They did it for two or three months and spent millions in the process. I think we should have answered them sooner, but uh, we finally did, and I think we're straightening that record. Thank you very much, Senator Lloyd Benson of Texas. Whatever happens tonight, Senator Benson is expected to return to the U.S. Senate. In Texas, it's the LBJ law. You can run for vice president and for the U.S. Senate at the same time. Benson is doing just that. We'll be back after this word. NBC News Election Night Headquarters. This is Election Night 88, reported by Tom Brokaw, with John Chancellor, Connie Chung, and Garrick Utley. Decision 88 Election Night coverage is sponsored in part by Merrill Lynch, an investment firm built on a tradition of trust. By Team Xerox, a world leader in document processing. We document the world. By Kellogg's Nut and Honey Crunch, the taste of nuts and honey with a hearty crunch, now in new biscuits, too. And by GE, 
From aircraft engines to appliances, we bring good things to life. Now, here is Tom Brokaw. Hello once again. Well, the big NBC News election map behind me is a quick snapshot of where the election stands at this hour. The blue states all belong to the vice president. The red state of Massachusetts and the District of Columbia to Michael Dukakis. But keep your eye on those Midwestern industrial states because the polls have closed in many of them. And we are still not able to make a projection in those states after almost two years of campaigning. This election still hangs in the balance. However, we do have some late projections now at this hour. More good news for Vice President Bush tonight. We are able to project that Vice President Bush will win in his boyhood home of Connecticut with eight electoral votes. Let's go back out now to the Midwest, to the uh, Great Plains, Nebraska, five electoral votes there. Nebraska is solidly Republican in national elections. Down south in Louisiana, pretty much a Republican state, even though it's got a Democratic governor, 10 electoral votes there. Up now into the far west, the Rocky Mountain West, Wyoming, the polls are closed. Wyoming has three electoral votes. And the home of Barry Goldwater, Arizona, no surprise here. That goes into the Bush column. All of those states colored blue for Vice President Bush. A total of 33 additional electoral votes, 211 now. He is, as you can see, less than 60 away from the magic number of 270 electoral votes needed. 16 for Dukakis. The popular vote has creeped up to 13 percent, and it's closing a little bit. Now down to about eight points altogether. So that's where we stand at this hour. But Ohio, Illinois, New York now has closed. Pennsylvania. Those states that Dukakis is counting on so much, we still are not able to make a projection in them. And that's very much where this uh, election could be decided here tonight. John Chancellor. Tom, I think we're still waiting for the story. We haven't written the headline. We don't yet know how it's going to come out. And you just said it. New York, Pennsylvania, Ohio, Illinois, and Michigan. It does look as though Lloyd Benson didn't help a lot. Uh, there was talk when Senator Benson was put on the ticket that it would put Texas in the Democratic column. We have projected Texas in the Republican column. It also, according to our projections, Benson's presence didn't, presence didn't help in two other so-called petroleum states, Oklahoma and Louisiana, we have now projected as victories for George Bush, so that the, the Benson's popularity apparently didn't spill across the border in Texas to the north or to the east, but mainly you have Bush in 20 states as of now, but we're still waiting for the big Middle Western industrial states where the polls showed that things were close and getting closer in the final days of this campaign. You remember, Tom, by 9 o'clock Eastern Time in 1980, Jimmy Carter had conceded, gone into that hotel ballroom and done it, and that in, by this hour in 1984, we knew that Walter Mondale had had it. Well, and you know that Mike Dukakis raced back and forth across the country to hit California and Michigan and Ohio as much as he could in those closing hours. We have another state now to project for Vice President Bush. The tiny state of Delaware has three electoral votes. They're all important on a night like tonight. That means that the vice president's uh, electoral vote total now, as we color in the state of Delaware blue for the vice president, the vice president's electoral vote total goes to 214. 270 are required to win. You only have to win each state by as little as one vote to get all the electoral votes in that state. So the popular vote is not as important. A reminder, once again, we project these states only after the polls have closed. We want to remind you as well that polls still are open in many states in this country, especially on the Pacific Coast and in the Rocky Mountain West, so you still have an opportunity to vote. Gary Cutley, some late calls for us in the uh, Senate congressional some governor's calls races. just coming in, Tom, in the uh, Senate races around the country. In New York State, uh, no surprise at all, Daniel Patrick Moynihan has been re-elected to the U.S. Senate, a very popular and powerful Democrat. No real opposition is running. His op opponent couldn't even afford to buy uh, bumper stickers for his campaign. In Arizona, again, an incumbent uh, being returned to the Senate, Dennis DeConcini, the Democrat, uh, a winner there, according to our projection, in the neighboring state of New Mexico. The same story for the Democratic incumbent, Jeff Bingaman, defeating his Republic op uh, Republican opponent, Bill Valentine. In Nebraska, though, a surprise in that Bob Carey has defeated David Carnes. Now, not really a surprise in the sense that Carey was favored uh, in the polls, but uh, the fact is that it is a Democratic victory taking a Republican seat. 
Bob Kerry is a former governor there. He is very popular, Vietnam War veteran, lost part of his leg in action in Vietnam. And now going to the Senate is expected that he'll become a major figure, a new face in national democratic politics. Bob Kerry picking up a seat for the Democrats in Nebraska. We want to show you a couple of states right now where they're very close races. In Florida, for example, you really can't get much uh, closer than what we see here with 12% of the votes in. Um, Connie Mack, the Republican, and Buddy McKay, the Democrat, two congressmen, are neck and neck. This is a Democratic seat which was held by Lawton Childs, who is retiring. We really can't call it. What we can say right now is that Mack is getting the Hispanic vote in Florida, which is very important. McKay is getting the black vote, which is very important. They're going after the white vote uh, um, as much as they can. It may be a very long evening in uh, Florida. And in Mississippi, another race. We have Trent Lott and Wayne Dowdy locked in a very close battle, just four percentage points separating the two. This, too, is a Democratic seat held by John Stennis. Lott leading right now, but that's anybody's game too early to call. So when we look at the new Senate makeup right now, this is what we have. We have the Democrats picking up three seats in Virginia, in Connecticut, and in Nebraska. Right now, it's, um, well, you say Democrats 51, but there's a net gain of three so far for the Republicans. We're looking at the seats that have been um, settled so far. But right now, on balance, it's a gain of three seats, Virginia, Connecticut, and Nebraska, for the Democratic Party in the U.S. Senate. Briefly, Tom, in the governor's races, we have a call to make in West Virginia. Arch Moore, the incumbent, is defeated. We project that Gaston Caperton, the Democratic candidate, has won in West Virginia. That is the end, probably, of a 30-year-long career for Arch Moore in West Virginia politics. One of the most colorful politicians in the country. You know, when uh, Bob Kerry was the governor of Nebraska, you may remember, he has a Congressional Medal of Honor, a real hero out there. He had a relationship with the actress Deborah Winger, and for a time, even though they weren't married, she was living in the governor's mansion, and he likes to tell the story that they did a statewide poll, and something like 72% of the people in Nebraska said it's okay for Deborah Winger to live there, and only about 65% thought it was okay for him to live there at the same time. <laughs> she should run. <laughs> That's right. So we'll be hearing from Bob Kerry, I think, in the course of the, of the next eight years or so. Um, standing by now on the White House lawn is NBC News correspondent Jim Mikloszewski. And at the living quarters tonight, President and Mrs. Reagan must be a kind of nostalgic time for them, Jim. The president was out on the stump yesterday in San Diego talking about his parents, Jack and Nellie Reagan. What a long and honorable journey it has been from that small town in Illinois all the way to the White House. Now at the age of 77, he's watching the results from the last election of his career, the one that will send him into happy retirement in California. What are you hearing there tonight? Well, we're hearing that although the Reagan presidency may be nearing its end, the Reagan era by a long shot is not over, according to people here in the White House. Now, as for the president and Mrs. Reagan, they're upstairs in the residence at the White House. They're watching the returns on television, as seen here in this photo provided to us by the White House. They're also throwing a private party for some 20 guests and friends, including some key cabinet members like Secretary of State George Shultz and Secretary of Defense Frank Carlucci. This comes, as you say, Tom, after some rigorous campaigning by the president, uh, unprecedented campaigning by a president for a sitting vice president. He traveled some 25,000 miles in recent weeks on behalf of George Bush. And that's because aides say that the president had a personal stake in this election, that a vote tonight for George Bush was a vote for Reagan's policies, for a continuation of the Reagan era, for the Reagan legacy. And although aides here don't want to take anything away from George Bush, it's clear that some of them feel that a vote for George Bush today was a vote for Ronald Reagan. Tom. Thank you, Jim Mikloszewski. There were not many uh, bumper stickers in the course of this campaign for one reason or another. One of the better ones around was a sign that they held up at a Dukakis rally or at a Bush rally. It says, Reagan takes naps, Dukakis causes them. <laughs> we'll be back after this. We continue to move through the evening, and at this hour, there still is not a candidate with 270 electoral votes. That's what it takes to become the 41st president-elect of these United States. George Bush is closing in on it, but most of the states that he's won are those that we expected him to win. 214 for Bush, as you can see. That's a big lead over Mike Dukakis. But the popular vote in some of the battleground states is very close. Now, that's what it is nationwide. 16% of it has been counted. And it's drawing down closer now. It's down to 12 percentage points between them. But let us show you what is going on in some of these key states that we've been watching tonight. By the way, in our map, blue is for Bush, red is for Dukakis. 
Here is uh, the battleground now in Maryland. Almost 40% of the vote has been counted there. As you can see, Bush has a lead of 12 points, but we think it's still too close to call because the votes have to come in from certain areas. Also in Ohio, one of the principal battlegrounds of this election, Bush with a considerable lead there in that popular vote with 16% of it counted, but key areas still to check in. Pennsylvania. 22% of the vote has been counted. Dukakis is counting heavily on Pennsylvania. He's got a four-point lead. In Michigan, 4% of the vote has been counted. That's a state that's been battered, of course, uh, by Reaganomics during the last eight years. Bush is up in Michigan with only 4% of the vote, and that's going to be one of the pivotal states before this night is out. Same is true in Illinois. Illinois has gone for a Republican the last five times. 6% of the vote has been counted. And as you can see, Dukakis with a very narrow lead. He's expected to do well in Cook County. But then the question is, what happens in those blue-collar suburbs around Chicago? And more importantly, what happens downstate? Actually, the blue-collar suburbs are becoming more and more Republican and voting conservative Democrat or conservative Republican in the past presidential elections. Senator Alan Simpson is one of the more colorful members of the United States Senate from the state of Wyoming. He's with us here tonight. Senator Simpson, whoever wins tonight, whether it's Michael Dukakis or uh, Vice President George Bush, as you have been saying repeatedly, faces a daunting task in getting the deficit back in line. Do you think that the head of the ticket in your party is prepared to face up to that, to the hard decisions that are going to have to be made? Or do you think that the mm -hmm. flexible freeze idea that he has been spelling out, Vice President Bush, in effect, can work? Well, we'll try his package, but I, I'm, I'm one who wants to see what the National Economic Commission is going to furnish us. I think that the work of Drew Lewis and Bob Strauss is very worthy of our attention, and we must pay close attention to it. We really, you know, we really have to deal with issues uh, like Social Security and entitlements and Medicare and Medicaid and benefits of all kinds, and, and we're going to have to do that in Congress in a very bipartisan way. And take the new president and say, you know, here we are, we're ready to help and do it early before we get caught in a bunch of high old partisan games. That's for sure. Senator Simpson, uh, you were once considered a vice presidential candidate during the course of the summer. Since then, you've been able to spend a fair amount of time in your home state of Wyoming. Now, as you look at this national presidential race from those high peaks and through that clear air. <clears throat> yeah, rarefied. Rarefied air. <laughs> yes. What's your judgment about what you've been seeing? Have you been pleased? Yeah, uh, I have. Uh, I think there's an a, a awfully good national vote, uh, some tough Senate races uh, that are, are, are a little puzzling to me, uh, but uh, the people have uh, submitted uh, their, their judgment. We're, gonna, we're really going to have to work so closely together in Congress, and I hope that, uh, that uh, whoever the new Democratic leader in the Senate is, one of three, uh, uh, Jim Wright, uh, that, that every week or once every couple of weeks that George Bush and Dan Quayle will sit down with those people and we'll really talk about things like what is the agenda, what do we need to do, let's try to do something that the American people would have really appreciate us doing. Isn't that going to take profiles and courage on both sides to make those hard judgments about taxes and deficits and about consumer spending in this country? It is. But uh, for the first time, we can, if you, if you give a congressman cover, they'll use it. We had cover on the Social Security Commission. We had cover on the MX Commission. We had cover on other commissions. If we can have cover where, where they say this National Economic Commission says, here it is, guys, and you better be at your work be only, because you only have about 18 months to do it, we can perform that task, but, but if we that, don't do but it... But does that really help the political institutions in this country if you're always looking for cover, and especially after this presidential campaign, so, which some people have equated with mud wrestling? Well, well how I, do you get the people back behind the politicians? I don't think it's mud wrestling. It's, it's been some pretty sharp hand-to-hand uh, -hand combat, but it's not mud wrestling. But if the people of America, who are citizens first and Democrats and Republicans next, don't allow us to do some substantial things with the social security system which can't work under its present makeup where you get three bucks back for every buck you put in you had sixteen paying in thirty years ago and now you got three paying in and one taken out they gotta join us and and let me tell you it's going to be tough medicine all around but if they can't keep writing me letters about the deficit and what are you going to do about it slim and all that stuff and then sit it out they got to get in and do the mud wrestling with us. All right, Senator Simpson, we have an important call to make right here. If you'll just stand by, you can listen.
listen in as I tell you that uh, NBC News now projecting that Michael Dukakis is the winner in the state of New York. 36 electoral votes there. I can almost hear the cheer going up in the Dukakis headquarters. That was a key part of their strategy as they tried to piece together a victory in the Northeast and across the industrial Midwest. Uh, we'll add the state of New York to his total. Now 52 electoral votes. George Bush still well out in front, but again, no surprises for the vice president. And a lot of states with polls still open. The popular vote now up to 16%. And as you can see, there's a 12-point spread between them. But New York was crucial to Mike Dukakis. If he is to have a chance to win tonight, he has to win in the state of New York. And we have just projected him the winner there. Connie Chung, what have you been looking at? Age. How did young people vote? How did older people vote? And how about the baby boomers? Well, Ronald Reagan, four years ago, surprisingly won 59% of young voters. That's 18 to 24 years old. And I talked to a Bush, uh, a Republican pollster, who said that he was expecting Bush to win a 15% edge among young voters. I talked with some young voters in New York City, and here's what they had to say. Well, I voted for, I voted for Michael Dukakis. Uh, A couple of the policies of the economic policies of Bush, um, very much for the death penalty. I feel that I have had no problems under Reagan in the last eight years. I'm sure my parents would disagree. They know more about it than I do. Financially, I've just been a student. But I felt that Bush would be able to continue the success we've had in the last eight years. You may not have been able to hear that first young man. He voted for Bush and so did the second one. So you would think, perhaps based on also the Republican pollster who said that he expected Bush to win more young voters, that it might go that way. Well, as we look at the early returns of our exit polling, it's not so. 18 to 24-year-olds are almost evenly split. Dukakis, in fact, has a little edge, 52% to Bush's 48%. And how about the elderly? Well, the elderly sometimes go Democratic or Republican. You can't really tell they shift back and forth. What you can depend on is that they will vote. They are dependable voters. This year around, Bush is, seems to be winning in our exit polling, 53% to 47%. And finally, the baby boomers, Tom, the sort of 25 to 40 and something, they are not going either way. They're splitting it. Yeah, I'm willing to admit I'm not a baby boomer. Okay. I take myself right out of that category. I don't belong there at all. By the way, if you didn't vote for either one of these two guys today, you could vote for presidents on the New Alliance, Libertarian, Socialist Workers, National Economic Recover, Workers League, Socialists, Workers Party, Consumer Party, Prohibitionists, Peace and Freedom, and the American Party, just in case you didn't have enough choices. We'll be back after this. We're back. I was just checking my watch and the list of states in which the polls are still open. And there are still a lot of them, some including in the Midwest and in the Rocky Mountain West as well. Be sure if you want to vote, you still have an opportunity in those areas. The electoral vote at this hour. 270 are required to uh, win tonight. George Bush has 214. Mike Dukakis just checked in with the state of New York. That added 36 to his total. The popular vote then at this hour, 18% of it's been counted. And as you can see, the spread now is six points, but the important one to keep your eye on, the electoral vote, especially in the industrial Midwest, will continue after this. This is the NBC Television Network. We're back at another state to the Michael Dukakis column, the neighboring state of Rhode Island, which is just south of Massachusetts, of course. Four electoral votes there. That means that the electoral vote total has changed this way. Rhode Island gets the color red on our map tonight. Mike Dukakis now up to 62, George Bush 243, less than 30 away from a victory. 22% of the vote has been counted. It's now a 10-point spread between them. But that important vote is the electoral vote. We want to remind you that polls remain open in the Pacific Northwest, some of the Rocky Mountain states, even in the state of Iowa, I think, at this hour. So you still have the opportunity to vote, and we will not be projecting any states until the polls have closed in that state. However, it's worth pointing out again, it is conceivable that one of these two men will win enough electoral votes in the southeast, the east, and the midwest before the polls are closed in the west. That is, that they can be the president-elect even before uh, some of those states out there have voted. 
There are some very close contests still going on in those states that have not been shaded in that you see behind me. Let's begin with the state of Illinois, where 14 percent of the vote now has been counted. It's a flat tie at this hour. Now, we don't know where all of those votes are coming from, but our analysts are telling us that it's too close to call in Illinois. In Michigan, 8 percent of the vote has been counted there, and the spread is considerable 14 points. But again, it depends on the pattern of the votes. We still have not projected a winner in Michigan. In the important border state of Maryland, almost half the vote now has been counted. Bush has got a 12-point lead in the raw vote that we're able to count so far, but again, too close to call. Pennsylvania, big hopes here for Mike Dukakis. 40% of the vote has been counted. He's got a lead of eight points. He's going to have to hold that lead. We still cannot make a projection in Pennsylvania. Again, a border state, the state of Missouri, 34% of the vote has been counted there. And the spread there, as you can see, eight points to caucus out front he hopes to be able to win missouri that's part of his strategy here tonight that he can win in missouri so that's where we stand at this hour the electoral and the popular vote uh, george bush is within reach now of the electoral margin but he still has not yet achieved it nbc's gary cutley has been paying attention to the congressional the senate races and the races for statewide office like governor gary what do you have for us well we want to spend some time and talk about the senate races that are going on across the country now tom we've had a number of results a number of projections that we've been able to make so far this evening we want to review them right now and see who has been projected as a winner in the uh, senate races and as we look at the uh, at the boards we see that a number of races uh, the democrats have uh, been doing quite well in holding on to their seats in fact the democrats have taken three seats away from the republican party so far that's been in virginia where charles robb uh, won and in connecticut where joseph lieberman staged an upset victory over lowell weicker and in nebraska where bob curry defeated his republican opponent so far the republicans have not uh, won a uh, a democratic seat one of the non-surprises of the evening was the victory of Senator Edward Kennedy in Massachusetts this evening. Uh, he uh, was re-elected to a fifth term in Massachusetts. And, of course, what's interesting about Kennedy is not that he won, but that he'll be going back to the Senate again as Mr. Liberal. And it's going to be interesting to see in the 101st Congress the role of liberals such as Senator Kennedy, how they're able to work with George Bush if if he is the president in the White House because Bush has been using the L word to beat Michael Dukakis over the head with for so long. But the Democrats so far have been doing quite well. They've picked up three Republican seats. There's still some very close races we're watching in Florida and in Mississippi. And that's just about where we stand right now, Tom. Thank you, Garrick. Uh, NBC's Lisa Myers and Chris Wallace have put a lot of mileage under their belts during the course of this campaign. Primaries in general. Chris Wallace, you're up in Boston tonight. A couple of hours ago, there was a fair amount of elation in the Dukakis headquarters. They were still working the telephones, thinking they could win. Are they still optimistic? Well, Tom, it's interesting. Here in the World Trade Center, in the room where they're going to celebrate the, quote, victory party, they had a rock band. Now comedian Al Franken is telling jokes, and the, the crowd seems happy. But when you talk to the guys in the back room, the guys who have to count up the votes, that air of defiant optimism that we saw earlier is beginning to fade as they begin to see states that they were counting on, states like Connecticut, going into the Bush column. Now, they say it's still mathematically possible for Dukakis to win, but they realize that politically it is a real political long shot at this point. So I'd have to say that that air of easy optimism has gone. I should tell you one other story. A young woman, an advanced woman, who organized a lot of Dukakis events all over the country, came into our NBC workspace a few moments ago, watching the projections, the vote for Bush beginning to mount up, and she started to cry. And I'll tell you, that more than anything else told you that they're beginning to realize here this night is not going their way. Well, it's a long reach for them still at this hour, but they must be feeling a little better, I would think, at the vice president's headquarters, Lisa Myers. They're feeling terrific here, Tom. When you, excuse me, when you predicted Ohio, projected Ohio, it was the biggest applause in the room all, all night, even more than they gave Crystal Gale a little bit earlier. I was told a few minutes ago by one of the vice president's senior aides that they were on their way to the vice president's suite in the hotel to tell him that they do believe he will be the next president. They have gone over the numbers in all the various states, and they just do not see any way at this point that Dukakis can deny the, uh, George Bush the presidency. And where are they looking now for the next crucial state in your judgment, Lisa? Illinois and Michigan, are those the two states that they really feel? Well, they are 
anticipating now, Tom, that Bush will carry Michigan. They know it looks close and they're a little bit nervous about it, but they do think he will carry Michigan. They're not counting on Illinois, though. If Vice President Bush, by the way, does win tonight, he'll be the first sitting vice president to be elected since Martin Van Buren, who was Andrew Jackson's vice president in 1836. And if all that happens tonight, we're not yet sure that it will, it will make it a little easier for him to think back to the Democratic National Convention last summer. James Hightower, who's the agricultural commissioner from Texas, described him in that great hall. George Bush is a man who was born on third base and thought that he'd hit a triple. That didn't go over too well with many of the people in the Bush campaign, uh, especially many members of the people in the, uh, in the uh, Bush family. We're now able to project still another state for Michael Dukakis. Uh, this is the state that has been standing loyal and true by its Democratic candidates. It's the state of Minnesota. Uh, we are projecting that the 10 electoral votes in Minnesota will go to the Michael Dukakis column. So let's check that total now. He is now up to 72. George Bush has 243 within reach, as we say, of the 270 required to win. Fully one quarter of the popular vote has been counted. As you can see, the spread is 10. Minnesota, after all, is the home of Mondale and Hubert Humphrey and Gene McCarthy. And in the last five elections, it's only gone Republican one time. Most other states in this country have just a reverse pattern of all of that. Uh, John Chancellor, what have you been looking at? Defense spending? Defense spending is really striking. Uh, Tom, as you recall, in 1980, in 1981, Reagan's first year in office, 63% of the public was telling our poll that they wanted more money spent on defense. Where is it today, seven years later? 14% of our big sample across the country today with the Wall Street Journal says spend more on defense. 82% of all the voters we talk to today say spend less or stay where you are. And the reason for that I believe is that Ronald Reagan has persuaded the American people that the United States is stronger now and they believe him. And I think there's also a Gorbachev factor. We've signed a treaty on nuclear weapons with the Soviet Union. Mr. Gorbachev is making these interesting speeches and statements about Soviets and perhaps that's a factor in it. The interesting thing when you look into these figures is that 80 percent of the conservatives we talk to, always strong on defense spending, said keep it where it is or, or lower it and spend even less. And so for the next president, this is going to be a little complicated, especially if it's George Bush. He wants more money for the Strategic Defense Initiative. They want more money for forced modernization. There are a number of things that people want to spend on defense, but the public has rather resoundingly tonight, Tom, or today, told our pollsters that they don't want it increased and they just as soon keep it about where it is. All right, thank you very much, John Chancellor. Gary Cutley, some more results for us? Yes, a result from Minnesota. We can now project that uh, the Republican incumbent, David Durenberger, has been reelected in Minnesota, defeating Hubert Humphrey III, Skip Humphrey, the son of the uh, former vice president and senator from Minnesota. David Durenberg reelected in Minnesota for a second term there. It was a very tough race, but Durenberg is winning it rather easily. We mentioned a moment ago about the future or the fate of liberalism in this country, the L word, if you will, and how Edward Kennedy of Massachusetts is Mr. Liberal in the Senate. He has won tonight, and he's standing by in Boston. Congratulations, Senator. I Thank you very much, you. Mr. Adler. Talking about liberalism, there are probably several of that members of that endangered species, if it is that, around the country listening, looking at you right now, and wanting to know what is the future of liberalism in Congress, in politics, in this nation today, if George Bush wins tonight. Well, I think it's uh, very, uh, very well and, and uh, sound, and I think it's going to be presenting uh, these ideas to the, uh, the Congress in the next, uh, next Congress. Uh, let's talk about them. Daycare. Uh, the American people, with the change in the workforce, are really concerned about this issue. Parental leave. No person should have to make a choice between uh, the job they need and the child that they, uh, they love. Uh, I think health issues are a common uh, concern to people uh, during the, this uh, debate. Uh, we picked up uh, support in the Senate, we picked up support in the House of Representatives. In places where these issues were really debated and discussed, uh, we've gotten a, a very, very positive uh, response. Senator, People are basically talking about fairness and decency. Senator, That's what's uh, important, yes. If George Bush is elected, will Congress, a Democratic Senate, be able to work with him? Well, I think the problems are too important for the Congress not to work with the President. We're still hopeful back here that Mike is going to be able to put it together, but we're going to have to deal with these issues. Uh, there's been a, obviously a tough feeling with regard to the negative campaigning, but I think uh, everyone understands that these problems are too important 
not for us to try and work together. And a one-word answer, is there going to have to be a tax increase in the next four years, in your view? Uh, I don't think uh, you have to in terms of individual taxes or the uh, corporate taxes. I think there's programs that can be cut, savings that can be cut back, uh, the subsidization, for example, in the nuclear industry. There's, uh, there's a lot of uh, areas of where we can uh, uh, see a reduction in expenditures and also foreign investment into this country that's not taxed at the rate that it should. Um, there, there are areas in where we can put together a package that can put us back on a, a sound economic road. Senator, thank you very much. Senator right. Edward Kennedy in Boston tonight. As you can see, Tom, everyone is thinking about taxes but dancing gingerly around the question. Well, another familiar family name in politics, of course. We've had Humphrey defeated tonight, by elected in Indiana. And Senator Kennedy's son, Patrick Kennedy, ran for the Rhode Island legislature and spent 66 bucks a vote which came as a surprise to his father when he heard that on the evening news. We'll be back after this. George Bush, always the best friend, the aide-de-camp, now very close to being elected president of the United States, the first sitting vice president to do so. Since 1836, this is the electoral vote at this hour. He is not yet home. Michael Dukakis still has hopes. But here's how the numbers stack up right now. 270 are required to win. George Bush, as you can see, is less than 30 away. Mike Dukakis, still a long way to go. Just about 200 votes he requires. Popular vote? It's continuing to come in. 28% of it's been counted. A 10-point spread. Uh, the vice president's still out in front. Key states still to check in on the NBC News projection list include Illinois, Michigan, Wisconsin, and those states out west. We'll be back after this. This is the NBC Television Network. This is Decision 88, Channel 4 News coverage of the 1988 general election. Brought to you in part by Cumberland Hall and by Sprint's Furniture. NBC News Election Headquarters. This is Election Night 88, reported by Tom Brokaw, with John Chancellor, Connie Chung, and Garrick Utley. Decision 88 Election Night coverage is sponsored in part by Ford and your Ford dealer. Have you driven a Ford lately? By Merrill Lynch, an investment firm built on a tradition of trust. By GE, from plastics to financial services, we bring good things to life. And by Kellogg Special K. Now, here is Tom Brokaw. Hello once again. Well, it does appear that George Herbert Walker Bush, at the age of 64, after eight years as Vice President of the United States, term in Congress, Chairman of the Republican National Committee, the United States Representative in Beijing, the United States Representative to the United Nations, a privileged background that included Andover and Yale, a World War II hero, that he's about to become President of the United States. He's not yet there, but NBC News is now able to project three more states for the Bush column. We begin with the state of Maine and its four electoral votes. Four electoral votes in Maine on our map. That means blue for the state of Maine, which has been going uh, Republican the last four presidential elections. In North Dakota, three electoral votes go to George Bush for the last five presidential elections. has gone for the Republican ticket. And in Utah, a solidly Republican and conservative state, George Bush, the winner there of its five electoral votes. What does that mean in terms of the electoral vote total? Well, 270 is the number that George Bush wants to reach tonight. He is, as we say, very close to that indeed. 
He is now, as you can see, only 15 votes away from the 270 needed. And there are some states that are outstanding that are safely in his column. The popular vote, we're reaching the one-third level now, and the spread is about 10 points altogether. That could change before the course of the evening. We want to remind you that we still have some important states to come in here tonight, and that includes the states of Illinois and Michigan and Wisconsin. So those will still be coming along. John Chancellor, it is shaping up as a George Bush map as we look at it back there. It certainly is, Tom. And uh, we're still waiting on... The Pennsylvania is very close at this hour. Illinois is very close. Michigan, we're still waiting for Detroit to come in, but Bush is doing quite well elsewhere in the state. Uh, in Illinois, Chicago is very heavily for Dukakis. Uh, the suburbs, as you said earlier, the collar suburbs, where there are more Republicans now, very strong for uh, George Bush. Uh, in Pennsylvania, Philadelphia, though, went 67 percent for Dukakis, and Pittsburgh went 75 percent for Dukakis in Pennsylvania, but that still is much too close to call and could go either way. One of those states is going to make Bush the next president, if it, if it goes his way. And the fact of the matter is that as we look at that national map once again, the Democrats have a real problem in this country as they run for president of the United States, any of the national offices. They continue to do well in the statewide offices, but when they run nationally, that solid South now checks in for them. The Southwest, where the vote is shifting in this country, across to the Southwest, those fastest growing states are places like Florida and Louisiana and Texas and Alabama and the Carolinas. They're all solidly Republican. And they don't mind being it. They vote for Democrats for other offices and stay in the Republican column every four years. And I'm, we may someday, if these current trends continue in elections, you could just paint that map blue and not have the lights on it. All right, John, we're going to show you what uh, the popular vote is now in some of these key outstanding states. Let's begin with the state of Illinois. Cook County, of course, is the Democratic stronghold there, but in those blue-collar suburbs and downstate, it's still Republican territory. About a third of the vote has been counted. Presumably, a lot of that has come from Cook County, where they get a snappy return out of those city uh, precincts. And uh, Mike Dukakis has a four-point lead there in Michigan, which has a Democratic governor, after all, and two Democratic senators. Uh, Bush has a considerable lead, 14 points, with 13 percent of the vote counted. He'd like very much to have that in his column tonight. Wisconsin, a tightly contested race. Only 10 percent of the vote has been counted. And as you can see, it's almost too little to make any difference at this hour. Mike Dukakis with a big lead in Wisconsin. Missouri, this again was one of those battleground states. 40 percent of the vote has been counted. And uh, Mike Dukakis has a six-point lead in Missouri. Maryland, a border southern state like Missouri, almost 70 percent of the vote has been counted. The vice president with a six-point lead over Mike Dukakis. Pennsylvania, this is a big hope for Mike Dukakis tonight. 57 percent of the vote has been counted there. It represents the heartbeat, really, of the old Democratic Party. It's ethnic and working class. It has rural and urban areas. And as you can see, Mike Dukakis has a lead there. So that's where we stand at this hour with uh, those votes in those key states. Anne McLaughlin is in, uh, I think, Washington tonight. No, she's in Houston, Texas. Houston. She's down there for the festivities. Madam Secretary, welcome. You're the Labor Secretary, of course. And one of the problems that we have been hearing about this evening for Vice President George Bush, even though he seems to be doing extremely well overall with the national electorate, he still has a problem with women, according to our Election Day voter analysis. How do you think he can begin to address that? Well, I think he's addressing it first and foremost by talking about issues that are of concern to women. And they're not necessarily women's issues, they're economic issues. They're issues of education, of family, and of those who want a job being able to have a job. And I think what will happen now that we see a Bush victory right within our reach here, Tom, is a chance for a lot of people around this country to get together under President Bush, his leadership, uh, that'll be uh, a labor on the one hand, it'll be business on the other, be teachers, educators, be people like uh, uh, women who have built businesses during this economic recovery, and will help the president continue to build this great country to be competitive globally. One thing we've seen recently is women have taken so many of the jobs that have been created. Women look at uh, really the country and our future through the eyes of their children, and the vice president has pledged to uh, be the education president because he wants to build a quality system of education in this country so we can compete abroad. Secretary so McLaughlin. I think you'll 
I think you'll find us all pulling together uh, here starting tomorrow. Do you think that he also needs, however, to appoint some high visibility, conspicuous women to some important post in his next cabinet if he's elected tonight? Tom, I'm not sure you mean conspicuous women, but I know what you mean. Yeah. I, think I, I mean <laughs> high visibility women appointed to conspicuous posts. Thank you for bailing Surely. me out of that. Let me say. Let but women me say, can be conspicuous as well. Women can be conspicuous as well, but I think I know what you're saying. Obviously, I think that there are a good number of women who would be uh, perfect to serve in the Bush administration. The important thing to note is that uh, under the Reagan Bush administration, there were more women appointees than ever before in history, and we'll continue that trend. And I think that uh, clearly um, uh, the, the makeup of the administration will be something that uh, George Bush has shown during his campaign, that he wants to speak and work with all peoples in this country to continue to build a great nation and, uh, and be able to, as I say, compete abroad. Obviously, I think uh, women have a role to play, but I think we've already had a good record and we'll continue that. Thank you for being so graceful and so visible, and I'll leave conspicuous out of the factory. <laughs> That's all right. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank Secretary you. of Labor Ann McLaughlin will be back right after this. Or before very long, that is. Michael Dukakis's big uh, hopes for the evening had been that he could do well in the industrial Midwest and put together Massachusetts and New York and Connecticut and states like Pennsylvania. A big question, Connie Chung, what about the blue-collar voters? Did they come back to the Democratic fold this time? Obviously, they didn't come back in large enough numbers in a lot of those states. Mm -hmm. We don't think so. Um, you know, the image of the blue-collar worker has really changed. We, we always think of the blue-collar worker, I think, as a labor union uh, representative, works in the uh, manufacturing sector. But that image is very misleading today. Today, they are better educated. They're not all manual. They're in service jobs. And as their image has changed, so has their voting pattern. They are less wedded to the Democratic Party. Uh, they make up of about 15 percent, according to our exit polling, of the electorate today. So how did blue-collar vo voters vote today? Well, we need to separate them out between black blue-collar voters and white blue-collar voters. And the reason is, is because black blue-collar voters usually go Democratic. And this year, according to our exit polling, they are going 91 percent to Dukakis. So let's look at the figures for white blue-collar voters. Here they are, going for Bush, 54 percent, for Dukakis, 46 percent. Bush is taking the lead there. Now, one of the questions George Bush asked during his campaign is, are you better off today, better off than you were eight years ago? And Ken Bode asked blue-collar workers in Flint, Michigan, that very question. And here is his Precinct Express report. Connie, Flint, Michigan is a town with 15% unemployment. If you live here, you're likely to know somebody who's out of a job. It's a place where the answer to George Bush's question is not automatically yes. At Civic Park Elementary, Gerald Comer, age 75, was decidedly in the minority. Why did you vote for Bush and Quail? Well, I think they're on the right track. That's what I think. Keep it up and keep it going and try to finish up what they're doing. The voters at Civic Elementary, blue-collar workers, black and white. The sort of folks who often feel economic recession first and economic booms last. How do you answer George Bush's question? Michigan's lost too many jobs in this state since Reagan's been president. Me, myself, I am because of my job I got. But as far as society is, no. With the, with the community that, that I live around, no, they not. Friends that I have, they not. There is a lot of people out of work. There's a lot of people working in Flint. They're out of work. Flint is a a lot of low-income families now, and kind of Mr. Regan and Mr. Bush. Personally, I could be better off, but I can see the community around me, the chances of the younger people getting good jobs, uh, a lot worse off, and I couldn't vote the Republican ticket. So most of the voters at Civic Park Elementary School in Flint told us they're voting for change. Connie? But our exit polling is showing something differently. Now, Michael Dukakis tried to appeal to blue-collar workers, particularly voters, particularly at the end of the campaign with the I'm on your side populist theme that may have worked for some towards the end. And he also tried to portray Bush as the wealthy country club Republican he would play at his rallies, I'm no millionaire son by Creedence Clearwater Revival. Maybe that worked for some, maybe it didn't for others. Tom? <laughs> Thanks, Connie. One of the problems they had down in the state of Arkansas, by the way, the Republicans were a little nervous about Arkansas. It turns out that they won it tonight, but they put out some uh, radio ads for the deer hunters because the season opened last Saturday, and they urged them to cast their absentee ballots before they left to go into the uh, boonies to go deer hunting. Well, I don't know how the deer hunters voted in Arkansas, but anyway, George Bush was able to win there. One of the predominant figures on the American political scene for the past couple of years and then four years ago as well, 
Reverend Jesse Jackson, who's with us tonight. I want to begin, Reverend Jackson, by asking you a question. You were quoted in the Sun-Times last Sunday as saying, if Dukakis loses on Tuesday, the next political season will begin on Wednesday. A, does that mean that you're beginning to run tomorrow if he loses tonight? And B, do you think that that was very helpful to him in the last four days of the campaign? Well, first of all, uh, Michael Dukakis is to be congratulated for having run a good and gallant and honorable campaign. And George Bush, it seems, is, is president-elect and likewise must be highly regarded. And in his reach out for a kind and gentle nation must attract bipartisan support and dialogue. Uh, secondly, uh, the, the next season does begin tomorrow. But what does that really mean? It means the Democratic Party leadership must now come together and cut our losses. We lost the White House with a net gain in the Senate, <clears throat> a net gain in the House. We must now take the responsibility to put forth a legislative agenda that will in fact represent prenatal care for women, daycare for children, equal rights for women, fair prices for farmers, raising minimum wage for workers. That's what begins on tomorrow. Big city elections in 1989, a 1990 census to count, 1991 reapportionment. That is the agenda of hope, and that must be the agenda for the Democratic Party. Reverend Jackson, as you were probably listening tonight to other senators and members of Congress, Danny Rostenkowski from Chicago, Bill Bradley from New Jersey, uh, Bob Dole from Kansas, who's the Republican leader, they're all talking about the deficit, and that was very much on the minds of the voters today. It was the number one issue by a factor of two to one. The fact of the matter is that someone's going to have to hold the line for at least the next year, if not the next two years, to get the deficit under control. Do you well, not you, agree it, with that? I do, but you know, that's, that's why on the desk of George Bush, January 21st, will not be who won the flag-loving contest. All of us love it. That's the tie, or the plight of Willie Horton. It will be that budget deficit. And of course, if you give the very rich a $40 billion capital gains tax break, you cannot reduce that deficit. There must be a commitment uh, to expand services for human beings, affordable housing and daycare. We simply cannot abandon human services anymore. Uh, I hope that we will focus now on budget deficit, trade deficit, and debt reduction but not sacrifice human services for people who are locked out of the American dream. Thank you very much, Reverend Jackson, for being with us tonight. Appreciate hearing from you again. I know that we'll be hearing from you again in the future. By the way, there were some ominous signs earlier tonight for Michael Dukakis when Delaware went for George Bush. He's voted with a winner every time since 1948. And Dukakis is a law school graduate. Bush is not. And since 1900, when lawyers and non-lawyers met in 12 of the 22 elections, in nine of them, the lawyers lost. I don't know whether there's a lesson in that or not, Gary Cutley. I'm not sure. I won't pick that up. But there's certainly a lesson about the power of incumbency today in the state of Utah. Orrin Hatch, and he is a lawyer, by the way, has been projected as our winner in the state of Utah, defeating Brian Moss. A personal story here because his opponent, Moss, is the son of former Democratic Senator Frank Moss, who was defeated by Hatch uh, in the 1970s. But today, Orrin Hatch re-elected in Utah. Now on to Mississippi and an important result. We can now project that Trent Lott, the uh, Republican whip in the House of Representatives, has won the state of Mississippi. This is a Democratic seat captured by the Republicans. Lott, we project, has defeated his Democratic opponent, Congressman Wayne Dowdy. It is important not only because the Republicans pick up their first Democratic seat, but it also shows, uh, unfortunately for Dowdy, the effect of Michael Dukakis. Uh, liberal politics just don't do very well down in Mississippi. Dowdy was worried about the Dukakis impact. He tried to distance himself from, uh, from uh, Dukakis, but it didn't work. The Republicans have won in Mississippi. We have a very close race we're following in Florida. We just want to keep you up to date on what's happening there. Connie Mack versus Buddy McKay. More than a third of the vote in. Too close to call, and you can see why. Finally, we want to show you the list of the winners in the Senate races this evening. There are a lot of them, so here they come. Uh, there were 33 um, uh, Senate contests from coast to coast, and these are our Senate projections. Mississippi, we just reported. Utah, Minnesota, where Hubert Humphrey III lost. Kerry won in Nebraska. That's a Republican seat captured. Most of these incumbents... And Howard Betzenbaum, the longtime liberal in Ohio, winning. 
and Rob winning in Virginia, picking up a Republican seat. Tom? Thank you very much, Garrick. We're going to take a look at the House makeup. But first, we're going to say we'll be back after this word. This morning. Oh, yeah, well, here we go. Yeah. We're back. Garrett Cutley, what about the uh, makeup of the House of Representatives? A big Democratic margin going in. Do they pick up any? Status quo in capital letters. We can now project the makeup of the new House. It'll have two more Democrats. It stays just about where it was. There is a margin of error of a few seats here, but for all practical purposes, no change in the House. Hmm. All right. Hmm. We'll be back with more after this. NBC News Election Night 88 coverage continues. Here is Tom Brokaw, NBC News. Good evening once again, and Vice President George Bush, who's been living in government housing for the past eight years, will continue to live in government housing. He'll move from Massachusetts Avenue to 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. NBC News now projects that George Bush is president-elect of the United States, the 41st president of the United States. Here is how he did it with the electoral vote. Let us show you, first of all, 270 required to win. He went over the top, 279. These are the states that he's won tonight. They're all colored in blue on the big NBC News map. As you can see it behind me, we'll flash them on and off. The two crucial states to put him over the top, according to our projections, Michigan and the state of Nevada. And that's the George Bush headquarters in Texas which is his home state and voting state, and NBC's Lisa Myers is standing by down there. Lisa, it's a triumphant moment indeed for a man who uh, earlier this year, when he lost in Iowa, thought that he may be out of it. He did, and he, one of the things that the people on his staff like to point out is that this is a victory that belongs to George Bush. Yes, they had a terrific staff. Yes, he had some very effective commercials. But George Bush had to perform, and he performed much better than many of them even expected. I wanted to show you, Tom, the hats that were passed out in the room. It says George Bush, 41st president. They had these in boxes in the Houstonian, and were just waiting for the right minute to bring them over. Well, they didn't overlook very much, I must say, in the course of this campaign. Lisa, as you follow them throughout, I know a lot of the credit belongs to the vice president because he performed so well in New Orleans last summer and then especially in that second debate against uh, Michael Dukakis. But how much credit would you give to that crack campaign management team headed by James Baker? Well, I tell you, the people in Republican circles say that it is it was as good a campaign staff as anyone ever put together, including Ronald Reagan. Many of those men were veterans of Ronald Reagan's two campaigns, and they knew how to manipulate the media. They knew how to uh, go after and put psychological pressure on their opponents. But one of the things they did right after the Republican convention, as you remember, Tom, is they went right at Mike Dukakis. They went to Boston, to Boston Harbor. They did everything they could to put as much pressure on that man and his staff in large part because they weren't very experienced. Thank you very much, Lisa Myers, who's done a marvelous job on behalf of NBC News of chasing uh, Vice President George Bush clear across the country and back on several occasions. We'll be hearing from her throughout the evening. Standing by now is uh, the Republican leader in the House of Representatives. He's still the minority leader after tonight, but he's a powerful voice in the nation's affairs, and that's Congressman Bob Michael from Peoria, Illinois. Congressman Michael, with a Republican president back in the White House once again, as you're summoned down there by Vice President Bush, as you no doubt will be, what will you tell him that he should have as his order of priorities for the new term of Congress opening January 20th in Washington, D.C.? Well, uh, uh, first of all, it doesn't look like there's going to be much difference in the numbers uh, either way. And I think, quite frankly, that uh, uh, moving aggressively on the deficit is the number one uh, issue that we ought to tend to. And, uh, and then we'll have to go from there. Uh, Congressman Michael, the, the vice president, as you know, has said, watch my lips, no tax increases. I'm going to stand by a flexible freeze in spending. I think we can grow out of the deficit. Any number of critics, including many in your own party, have said that's just not possible. What's your judgment? Well, I've never gotten myself quite in that kind of box because I found out last year in serving on the summit that I had to buy 
some tax increases along to get uh, some of the uh, uh, expenditure reduction. But by the same token, if the economy keeps perking along now, with unemployment down uh, to where it is, uh, we're going to have significant increases in the revenue next year that can, frankly, p keep us on the target on Grand Road and Hollings with some, uh, with some uh, cost of living increases in some of the programs. But I'd like to see some of the more longer range projections uh, of, the, uh, of the commission that has been appointed and what they foresee for us and then make a judgment call after uh, we've heard from them. But wouldn't you expect, based on what you've been hearing from that commission so far, Congressman, that they're going to recommend some form of new taxes and possibly a freeze in some of the entitlement programs. Well, I, yes, and I think maybe one of the things with respect to the vice president's position, no tax uh, increases, I think we ought to make some distinction here between marginal rates. We, str we uh, work so hard in tax reform to get marginal rates down to 28, 33 percent, and I think that's one of the things we definitely do not want to monkey with. Now, as a matter of fact, when we uh, had the summit agreement, we had to go around the edges for revenue from some other places, and that may very well be, have to be the case uh, this coming year. Congressman Michael, thank you very much. Congressman Michael, among other things, is a uh, man who likes to sing, and you'll hear him singing the uh, national anthem at any event that he's invited to do so at. NBC's Chris Wallace is in Boston tonight. Chris, it's now three for three. All the major networks have, of course, projected Vice President George Bush, President-elect Governor Dukakis is expected there momentarily, is he? That's right, Tom. He left his home in Brookline a short time ago. It's about a 20-minute drive from the suburb of Brookline over here to the World Trade Center, an exposition hall right on the Boston Harbor. He will be here in a few moments. And we're told he'll go to a, a holding room. He's, they've had an agreement that he would not concede before 11 o'clock. That, of course, to try to not to uh, discourage voters in the western part of the country. But one would assume now, shortly after 11, that he will come down to talk to that crowd of young supporters and give them the uh, the bad news officially that he is not going to be the next president of the United States. Chris, earlier today they were talking about trying to do at least well enough tonight to preserve a role for Michael Dukakis as a presidential candidate in 1992. I don't want to start running that campaign already, but given what's going on in that map behind me, what do you think the chances are that Michael Dukakis will be able to be a viable candidate four years from now? Well, it'd be pure speculation, but I wouldn't think that that would be very well received in the Democratic Party. There are going to be a lot of people who think that this is a race that could have been won. The very fact that it seemed to be fairly close even into the final week, despite the fact that Mike Dukakis had run a fairly weak campaign, is an indication that George Bush might have been beatable. And I'm sure there are going to be a lot of Democrats that, that feel that uh, Dukakis wasted an opportunity, one of the few that the Democrats have had over the last two decades, to take back the White House. Uh, he's got an immediate he's got an immediate problem tom and that is whether or not he's going to run for for re-election as governor of massachusetts in 1990 and when he comes back there are an awful lot of political problems here financial problems in the state of massachusetts and a lot of the massachusetts politicians both democrats and republicans have said that if he lost they couldn't wait to get him back in that governor's chair and to give him a very tough time thanks very much chris wallace and to you as well uh, our thanks uh, personal and otherwise for a job uh, that we know required a lot of your time. We, uh, we're very appreciative. We'll be coming back to you later this evening. Thank you very much, Chris Wallace, who uh, just in the course of the last four days, I think, has crossed the country probably 38 times. I mean, they, they called that plane Sky Pig. It was the 737 that chased uh, Michael Dukakis around the country. It was a terrible plane, <laughs> the worst of them all. Uh, John Chancellor, Mike Dukakis coming out of Atlanta was up how many points at that time? About 17, I think, or 18. And he went into what was effectively can be described as a swoon in August when uh, George Bush came out of New Orleans slashing and driving and making it very tough for him. And he stayed in western Massachusetts, that is, Mike Dukakis did. One of the stories was that uh, Michael Dukakis was getting bad polling. I mean, he looked weak in western Massachusetts. The problem, as I see it, was that the Dukakis campaign did it backward. Instead of moving out of their convention in Atlanta and locking up the core vote of the Democratic Party, the blacks and the poor, labor unions, all those people who are traditional Democrats, and then moving out to the swing voters, they started for the swing voters and in the last couple of weeks scrambled desperately to bring back the the core democrats and i think that was a strategic mistake of the first magnitude and many other people agree as well without getting the your basic support locked up with you all the way you're not going to win
Uh, there might have been an omen from Michael Barnacle, whom you know as the uh, popular and colorful columnist of the Boston Globe, who wrote some time ago about Dukakis going from Massachusetts to the nation, saying, there is no basic training when it comes going national. Everything else, running for governor or for senator, is AAA compared to the light and the pressure and the heat of hitting the bricks in a national campaign. And I'm afraid Mike Dukakis found that out. And he ran his campaign with such power from the top that he didn't take advice from Benson or from the experienced politicians who were around him and he's lost. We'll be back after this.